Well, praise God. Good evening, family of XL Assembly of God, Facebook family, all you brothers and sisters in Christ, all who have joined us these last few nights for our devotion time as we have been going through the book by Derek Prince, Shaping History Through Prayer and Fasting. Been going through the different chapters and using his godly insights and adding adding our own and, and what God has laid on our heart to add to it. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I've learned as much in the last uh, a week and a half uh, about prayer and fasting and about how to pray and who to pray for and and all as I have in a, in a, in a really long time. And, and to be honest with you, these uh, uh, last 10 days of, of, of fasting and just seeking God's face have just uh, just just blessed me, man. Blessed Irma. Uh, I want to thank everybody for praying for Irma. She's back to jumping up and down and picking up grandbabies and slinging them around. So whatever we truly believed, it was just a dart from the enemy that found a place to get by. We fought that thing in the spirit, not in the physical. And we know that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and principalities and spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places. And he didn't have a, all he did was run a bluff. And so God backed up his word uh, when we prayed and saw his face and confessed his word for healing. And we are so thankful that y'all joined us in, in, in praying for her. Uh, like I said, she's, she's good to go today. One of the reasons, just a little insight, and, and I, I don't know, you know, everybody lives in different places spiritually, and that's fine, man, because God told us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, and me and Irma, uh, this coming January the 6th, 2021, will be 30 years of being saved for me, and uh, Irma got saved uh, uh, four or five months before I did, so She's, uh, she's next month, I think is her birthday. But anyway, uh, we've, we've studied this word and, and we've sought the Lord. And, uh, one of the reasons that we believe so strongly that it was spiritual is because you could look at her from, from the front or from the back. And she actually went down and had a little, almost like a curve in her like, uh, I, I don't know how to explain it. We know through the word of God that there's a lot of different spirits in operation. Uh, spirit of Python is one. The spirit of Aries is one. There's just all Jezebel. There's so many spirits in operation. But it's almost like something hit her in the side and just just offset her, if you will. And when, uh, when, when, when we remove that dark through faith and, and prayer and trusting God's word, when God removed it, let me put it like that, uh, she's just straightened right back up, pain's gone, everything's good. So we understand that this spiritual battle we in has to be fought in the spirit. If it's a spiritual dark, now, now don't get me wrong, there are plenty of physical darts, plenty of physical pain and ailments that, that doctors can heal, that medicine can help with and different things. But when it's a spiritual disease, a spiritual affliction, a spiritual pain, then it can only be removed through spiritual matters. And so we praise God for the for the disciplines of fasting and prayer and watching God go to work on our behalf. I also need to remember uh, Brother Robert Botterford still in our prayers, Susan Lancaster is in Birmingham, you know, going through her going through her passion, if you will. You know, Jesus, when he entered Jerusalem on that last weekend, we call it his passion because he he so desired to get to that place where he could see an end. And Susan's at that place. Uh, we're believing, hoping, praying that she's seeing her end. Remember Aubrey and, and Judy English uh, going through some trials themselves. I know many of you out there are. Uh, we know about it. So can we just go to the Lord in prayer and Bring these needs before him and ask this blessing upon his word tonight. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, God. Oh, Lord, I love you, Lord. Lord, God, you and you alone know how much I love you, Lord. I tell you every day, Lord, that uh, one of my biggest concerns or fears in life is that everybody around me would find out just how little that I know what I'm doing or understand anything, Lord. But God, I completely and totally trust in you 
for all the wisdom I need, for every direction I need to speak to me in the way I should go. You said that still small voice would be behind me saying this is the way walk in it. And God, I've trusted that for a long time and you've never failed me yet, Lord. I need you, Lord. I'm dependent on you, Lord. I don't want to take a step without you. I'm like Moses now. We'll go, Lord, but if you're not going with us, then I'm not going. And Lord, I, I just, I, 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 the more, the longer I live, Lord, the more I realize how dependent we, I am upon you. And so tonight, Lord, we bring these needs before you into the throne room of grace. Just ask that you would have mercy on our brothers and sisters in their time of need, Lord. We give you praise and honor and thank you, Lord, for touching my wife, God. Lord, I know there are many others out there, Lord, that have back issues, that have other issues, Lord, but you're the same healer, Lord. You're no respecter of persons. And you told us, Lord God, that if we would seek you and serve you and follow in your ways, Lord, you wouldn't put any of the diseases on us that the Egyptians had, Lord. That just means that the things the rest of the world suffers, Lord, that we can be protected from, Lord, if we walk close enough to you. And Lord, I thank you, Father, that the enemy is defeated, that Jesus, when he said it is finished, he meant that was end of Satan's rule and dominion over mankind. So God, we thank you tonight. Now, Lord, we ask you to speak to us through your word tonight, Lord. Would you anoint your word, Lord, so that it finds a place in our hearts. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit say into the church. In Jesus' name, I pray and all God's people said, glory to God. So tonight, tonight is our next to last night. Tomorrow night will be our last night's of devotions. We will have, uh, it's hard to believe, but we will have completed our 12 days of fasting and prayer. Like again, I say, we can't, I can't thank you enough for, for joining us and, and, and just believe the tremendous return we're going to see on our investment. For God said, if he gives us five talents, if we'll do something with it and increase it, then, then blessed are you for, for doing what we were supposed to do with it. So I just believe that this time is going to uh, prove great benefits. And I pray that this is not the last time that you'll fast and pray for this nation. I pray that after we study a little bit tonight, that it'll just become regular to you. Now, some practical guidelines for fasting. In all three Christian disciplines that Jesus gives us in Matthew 6, the guidelines are all the same. For individual fasting and prayer and giving, there's no need to make a production out of it. Motive is paramount. Motive is everything. In Matthew 6, when he said, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men, but when you do a charitable deed, do not sound the trumpet. Verse 5, when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to let everybody see them. But you, you go into your closet in the secret place, and your father who's in there will reward you openly. And then when you fast, more when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites who lets everybody know that they're doing it. But you wash yourself, you clean yourself, you go all about your business like you've uh, eaten the five star grand grandma's uh, Uncle Herschel's breakfast. It uh, it it it, it uh, uh, well, thank you. Not Golden Corral. You see what I got on my mind? Cracker Barrel. Thank you very much for your help. So motive is everything. Uh, Galatians five eighteen tells us. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now listen, some pray in the morning. My best time of the day is early in the morning. I'm usually up somewhere around five and and that gives me a couple of hours when everything's still quiet. Uh, nobody's moving around a lot just to spend some time in the word and in the Lord's presence and pray. That's my time. Usually by, uh, you know, at nighttime, I'm, 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 I'm whipped, I'm ready. But some pray in the PM. And the Bible says we are to be led by the Spirit. So when you do it is up to you, but the motive behind why you do it, that's what's so important. Now, when corporate prayer or fasting or giving, there's no way to do it quietly without a public announcement, but we can keep our motives pure. So just like last Sunday or Sunday a week ago, when we called and proclaimed this fast, time of fasting and prayer, I couldn't have let all you know that we were going to do it without doing it publicly. But we can still keep our hearts pure before the Lord. We're not doing it to be seen. We're doing it to change and shape the history of our nation going forward. So some guidelines tonight 
for individual fasting because it's something that's not taught a whole lot. Now, me and Irma were taught early on in our Christian walk how important it was, and we've made a practice of it over the years, not as much in the last 10 years as in the earlier years, because I'll be honest with you, the older you get, the, the harder it is, especially if you've got medical issues or taking medicine, or just to be honest with you, you just get weak a whole lot faster than you did when you were earlier. So, but still, it is a uh, command by God. He didn't say if, he said when. So some guidelines for fasting. Enter a fast with positive faith. Hebrews eleven six says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe God is and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now listen to me. You have a right, a biblical right, to expect God to reward you when you fast. Matthew six eighteen, the father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So if you go into a fast, whether you proclaim it for yourself or where the spirit is leading into you one, if you go into it with the right motives, Father, I'm coming, to God. I just want more of you. I just want to be, what you do, how you do about this situation. Now, here are some, here are some things that I'd love to see happen. And these are according to your word. They're according to your will, God. I'd like to see my son saved. I'd like to see my granddaughter saved. I'd like to see my aunt healed. That's okay, because the Bible says when we come to God in faith, we can expect him to answer our prayers, expect him to reward us openly. And then second thing, going to a fast with, with, with should come from conviction that God's word commands it as a regular discipline. We shouldn't go into a fast thinking, well, just so-and-so did it, so I would. No, we should understand that God's word commands us to do so. Uh, Romans 10, 17 says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we see in Hebrews 11, 6, we've got to have faith to please God. Romans 10, 17 tells us how we get it. It's by hearing, by hearing, by the word of God. So don't wait for some emergency to drive you to fasting and praying and giving. Listen, I, with all my heart, I heard this years ago from some one of them red head, red faced country preachers, but this nugget I gleaned from him that was just so awesome. If you get up every day of your life and you sow, if you go outside and sow, if you throw seeds in the dirt, then two months from now, three months from now, four months from now, if you hungry and you need a harvest, all you gotta do is walk outside and harvest something to eat. Now, if you don't sow anything, then when you get down to a hard place, then you got to have a miracle. Now I want to ask you a question. If I if I if I sow every day, if I sow faith, if I sow the word of God, if I stand on it and speak it, then when it comes time that I I'm coming face to face with a hardship, all I got to do is reap. I have harvest, man, off of that that I've already sown because it's sitting there waiting on me. But if I haven't been doing that, then I hit that hard place. I got to have a miracle. Now I want to ask you a question. Is it easier? If we don't have the faith to give and pray and fast, what makes us think we're gonna have the faith to believe for a miracle? Unless we do like a lot of people and we're hoping somebody else has enough faith to pray us through. And see, we can't, we can't depend on that, folk, all the time. We gotta do our own praying, we gotta do our own fasting, we gotta do our own giving. When Jesus looked at you and said, well, I don't have anything to give. The widow with two mites gave everything she had and Jesus took notice of it. And I, I, I would, we don't know this for a fact, but I'd be willing to bet that she didn't do without from then on because God took notice of her faith. So don't wait till you need a miracle. Start sowing now. The third thing, start slow and, and increase. You know, don't, don't go on, well, I'm gonna do a seven day fast right off get go. No, you setting yourself up for failure, unless the Holy Spirit's leading you to now, don't get me wrong, but just start, start with a meal. Start with two meals, start with a day and build up and work to it, just like you would in anything else. And make sure that you allow time for Bible study, because here's what I know. If you're not feeding your flesh with food, if you'll feed your spirit with this bread of life, this word of God, I promise you, there are times I have felt just as full off this bread of life as I have ever eaten a tomato and bacon sandwich. It's the good word of God. 
And fourth, make a list of objectives. Your faith will be strengthened when you see God meet those objectives. You know, write down what you're looking for out of your fast. I have I have fasted before <clears throat> strictly for health reasons. You know, you, you go through a season, especially like the holidays, man, when you start it at uh, it, uh, Halloween and end up, you know, sometime in February, <laughs> eating off eating through all the holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's. And and typically, one of my favorite times of the year to fast is in January or February because you've just your body is just overloaded, man. And you can go into just a liquid fast, do a liquid fast, and just takes a day or two for that sluggishness to go away. But then all of a sudden, man, you feel like a, a brand new person renewed. It gives your body time to heal. And then number five, the guideline for that I do any time I've ever fasted over these last 30 years. I read Isaiah 58 every day. Read Isaiah 58 every day you're on a fast. If you're just skipping a meal, make sure you read Isaiah 58 during that meal because it will feed you, it will bless you. Is this not the fast I have chosen, God said. And then when you look at that list of stuff that God says he will accomplish through our fasting. Man, it, it, it makes it a whole lot easier to turn down that meal. Now, remember that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, according to 1 Corinthians six nineteen. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and it needs cleansing often. Uh, John Calvin, was it John Calvin or Martin Luther? Oh, Lord. It was one of those guys anyway that they wouldn't even, I think it was Calvin, he would not even ordain a Methodist minister unless he could find out that they had a disciplined life of fasting on Wednesday and Friday. That was their fast days. Every Wednesday, every Friday, they fasted. And if he found out that that man was not doing that, then he wouldn't ordain him in the Methodist face. That's how strong he thought. Listen, church, I believe with all my heart. God told me this, Lord, this November will be four years now. It's hard to believe that I've been back in Excel four years. But God told me before we left Lynette coming home, and I, I believe it. I believe that there's a move of the Holy Spirit coming that's going to be unlike anything the earth has ever seen before. I believe it, every fiber of my being. Habakkuk prophesied in Habakkuk 2.14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Well, we hadn't seen a move like that since Habakkuk prophesied that. We hadn't seen the whole earth full of God's glory like the, like the waters cover the sea. But I believe with all my heart it's coming. I believe there's going to be a last day's revival, a last day's in gathering that's going to blow everything out of the water that we've ever even imagined. I believe it. I don't think God's through with his church yet. I don't think he's going to leave 7 billion people on the earth without hearing the gospel and giving an opportunity to be saved. And if just a quarter of those people, just a quarter of those people get saved, then we're talking about almost 2 billion people. Try to imagine that multitude. Imagine that wave of the Holy Spirit sweeping across this earth. Now, We've talked about individual fasting. I want to talk about collective fasting for a minute. When a spokesman for God calls a fast in Matthew 18, let's look over there, I'll flip there real quick. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20, the scripture says this, Jesus, red letters, again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Collective fasting, unity. There is no greater Christian weapon in the universe than the power of unity. Unity is such a powerful force that Jesus tells us right here, if two of you will agree upon it on earth, concerning anything that they ask. Now we know that we got to ask according to God's will. It's got to be in this word. It's got to be a promise he's already given us. But if we ask anything, two of us agree for them, it will be done for them by my father in heaven. Period. That's, that's, it's red, it's red letters. So if Jesus has ever told us the truth, if he is the truth and he cannot lie, 
And the Bible says, God is not a man that he could lie. Then we know that we see it right here. If we agree on it on earth concerning anything we ask, and we know we're going to ask toward God's will, we're not asking out there in left field somewhere, then it will be done for them by our Father in heaven. Now in Ecclesiastes chapter four, and I want to flip over here and read this because this is just, man, it's just good stuff. Ecclesiastes chapter four, and this was written by supposedly the, uh, the, the wisest man that ever lived. Let's see, there's Song of Solomon. There's Ecclesiastes, there you are, buddy. I want you to read with me here in chapter, in verse nine through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? Watch this. Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. There is no greater Christian weapon than the power of unity. There is so much power in unity. Why do you think Satan fights it so? Watch this. It started all the way back in Genesis 1. In the beginning, we see it. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let us make man. That's unity. God said, I'm not doing it alone. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, we're all going to work together in unity and we're going to get this thing done. We're going to create man. Father made man. Jesus saved man. And the Holy Spirit keeps man. That's just as simple as it gets. Father made us, Jesus saved us, and the Holy Spirit keeps us. Jesus saves us. The Bible says the Holy Spirit comes and seals us to the day of redemption. When Jesus sends the angels to put in the sickle in the earth, he said, don't, don't worry about the tares right now because if you try to pull the tares up, you'll get wheat too. But when I send my angels and they put in the sickle, then they'll separate the wheat from the tares. How are they going to know what's wheat and tares? The mark of the Holy Spirit, the seal of the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all working together in unity. So if the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are that powerful in unity, imagine what his children can be when we walk in unity. Psalms 133, one of my favorite, oh, in the whole entire Bible. Let's just read this together. Take a minute. What, what are we doing good? I got five minutes. Psalms 133, one of my favorite quoted scriptures in the whole Bible. Watch this. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garment. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. And watch this. Watch this. When we dwell together in unity, watch what God does. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. The word of God says that Jesus came to give us life and give it more abundantly. Satan came to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus jap slapped him, took the keys to death, hell, and the grave away from him. And Jesus gives us life and gives it more abundantly. And God is a God of unity. He works in unity with the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he expects you and I to walk in unity too. When we fast, when we pray, when we give, that's why we do things corporately. That's why we gather together on Sunday mornings. That's why we're here tonight so that we can agree together because God knows how powerful unity is. And that's why Satan fights it so because he hates it. He knows the power in unity. He has no one to get in unity with. There's no one, no one but him. He tried to exalt himself by himself. And he's all alone now. He doesn't have any unity. God thought it. Jesus spoke it. And the Holy Spirit did it. Now Deuteronomy 32, 30 says, one can chase a thousand and two can put 10,000 flight. Now I don't know about where y'all went to school and how y'all's multiplication works out. But if one can do a thousand, then you would think two could do 2,000 if you add them together like that. But see, God's, God's multiplication and addition tables are not like ours. When God multiplies, he really multiplies. 
one can put a thousand to flight and two can put 10,000. The strength, the power of fasting is that when we get it right, it turns us in the direction of God. That's what it does. When, when it, fasting is called humiliating yourself or humbling yourself, if you will. When we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and turn and seek his face, it always turns us back to God, no matter which direction we're going in. I want to read one last portion of scripture tonight. If you'll turn with me to Joshua chapter 23. Joshua chapter 23. And we will end here tonight. But some principles, just some common sense principles for fasting. There's no, you know, the Old Testament had different fasts, different called fasts in it. Three days, Daniel fast. Actually, Daniel had two different fasts. Um, uh, if you if you go to the book of Daniel, but there's different fa But in the New Testament, Jesus just simply said, "When you fast, why is that? Because He knew we'd be led by the Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit would tell us how to fast. The Holy Spirit would tell us how to pray. The Holy Spirit would tell us how to give. See, I'm I'm, I'm gonna let you in on something, and and, and and things like this, when a preacher says can get him in trouble with some folks, but uh, you know, I'd rather. I'd rather be true to the word of God than worry about what man thinks. Really and truly, there's no such thing in the New Testament as the tithe. Jesus went above and beyond the tithe. He expected his people to at least give the tithe. What Jesus told us was, when you give, let every man prepare in his heart before he comes to the meeting what he's going to give for God loves a cheerful giver. And Jesus just, I believe, fully expected us if there was a need to make sure that need got met. Because in the New Testament church that was birthed on the day of Pentecost and that, the Bible said men and women sold stuff they didn't need and brought it to the church so they could distribute to people who had need. <clears throat> and I'll be honest, I'm so thankful that I serve with a body of believers who believe in helping their neighbor. If somebody's hungry, we're going to get them food. If somebody's naked, we'll get them some clothes. Somebody needs a place to stay, we're going to do everything in our power because we know that's what our Lord and Savior would have us do. I want to read this one last scripture in Joshua chapter 23, starting at verse 6. Joshua's in the, in the end of his life. He's getting ready to leave this earth, and this is what he pins. Therefore, be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. It takes courage to follow the Lord, folks. I thought I was a man before I got saved, but I can tell you right now, I've never met a man that matches up with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the most man's man that I've ever met in my whole entire life. And I'll follow him to the ends of the earth because he is a man. No man can compare with Jesus Verse seven, and lest you go among these nations, these who remain among you, you shall not make mention of the name of their gods nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them or bow down to them. I have a problem with bowing to anything except the name of Jesus. My word tells me every knee shall bow to him and him alone. But you shall hold fast to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. Watch this now. For the Lord has driven out from before you great and strong nations, but as for you, no one has been able to stand against you to this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he has promised you. Therefore, take diligent heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God, or else indeed, if you do go back and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go in with them, and they to you know for, for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, for they shall be snares and traps to you, and scourges on your side, and thorns in your eyes. Now, if you can't read that scripture right there, and see what's happened to us in our land. What we did, this nation started out saying, look here, we want you. We want you to come to this country but you're gonna to conform to our life. You're gonna to conform to our Bible, to our God. You're gonna speak our language. You're gonna do things. This is our land. We came here to set up a nation for God. 
that's going to serve the Lord with fear and trembling. Now watch what happened. Same thing that God warned them of about here. If you go back and clean to the remnant of these nations and make marriages with them and go in, they to you, know that it's for certain the Lord can't won't drive them out anymore. Why? Because God gives us choice. So in this land today, and don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about colors or nationalities, nothing, nothing. Everybody is equal at the foot of the cross. But once you convert, then you live a Christian godly lifestyle. And that's what this nation stopped demanding of the people who became citizens. That's one of the reasons we're in the mess we're in today. So we need to return to the Lord. If my people, we need to repent. We need to confess our sins that we've sit idly by and watched 70 million babies be murdered, that we've allowed ungodly, un, just the god awfulness ungodliness to run rampant in this land, that we need to confess our sins and repent, and we need to return to the Lord and watch the Lord go to battle for us. Because he said if we do that, then all we'd have to do is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Church, I hope we're going to finish up tomorrow night. I hope these last several nights have blessed you the way they've blessed me. I hope that God has spoken to us and he set our face like flint to seek a new course because I truly believe with all my heart. Pastor Allen, you believe a handful of people in Monroe County could change the, the course of this nation? There's no doubt in my mind whatsoever. Jesus took 12 men in the multitude among thousands and millions of people and he turned the world upside down you and i if we will seek the lord with fasting and prayer and seek god's face and live righteous lives before him i believe with all my heart that god will relent and send us just leaders and men who walk in the fear of the lord i believe that with all my heart god bless you and let me pray for you father in the name of jesus <clears throat> to all who's out there, Lord, that listen to these words. And Lord, I've, I've not said one single thing that's not in your word, Lord. It can be backed up with your scripture, Lord, not manipulated, not 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 uh, 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 added to or taken away. It's just simply your word, Lord. I don't think I'm one that believes you don't need help with your Lord, with your word, Lord. I, I don't believe it can be interpreted because if it's truth, Truth can't be interpreted. It's either truth or it's not. So, Father, I thank you, Lord, that you've spoken to us. I thank you that you've shown us the right way, the good way. I thank you that you're still small voices, still calling us and behind us saying, this is the way, walk in it. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. If, if a generation, if a nation, if a world has ever needed you, Lord, then it's ours today, Lord. Would you come down, Lord? Would you rip open heaven and come down, Lord, and intervene on behalf of your saints, Lord? You are our God. We are your people, the sheep of your pasture. We hear your voice and the voice of another. We refuse to follow, Lord. Come and heal our land, Lord. We beseech you. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Praise the Lord. I wanted to let you know one more quick thing. Uh, Calvin was able to get all these messages on YouTube. So if you missed any or want to go back and re-listen to any of them, you go to xlassembly.org. That's the website and you'll find the link and you can, you can go back and, and watch any of these, uh, not saying anything about the person who preached them, but the content is the content that's such a blessing. So we'll see you guys tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Can't wait. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Love you with the love of Jesus. God bless.